Nope. You're not tenured. I am not. So you're even more... It, it puts a little bit extra uncertainty in my life, yeah. And uh, I wish there was a lot more certainty in my life. Yes, that we all want, you know, it's like, you want to know what's going to come next. Yeah. Um, and of course, you have moved your family here to Alaska. You sort of embrace this community as where you live. Uh, yeah, the, the Fairbanks is a, a wonderful community, uh, a wonderful group of people, not only that I work with, but, you know, enjoying the community. And, uh, and it, it's been great to see that overwhelming support for uh, the university from the community and... Uh, I hope to see more of that, and you know, it makes me appreciate where I am, and uh, makes me uh, look forward to the future here, <laughs> whatever it may, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, are you you're teaching this fall? Your your classes change. You're still you've got students. All that is still going ahead as planned. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, we haven't seen any change in those kinds of aspects. So, yeah, I just checked my roster. I'm teaching the human microbiome in the fall. Still, uh, there's a wait list for it, so you know, hang in there if you're still thinking about taking it. <laughs> no matter what happens um, on September, on uh, July 30th, when the Board of Regents vote or the legislature gets working on the budget that they're working on, now the university is going to be it's going to be some form of a university in Alaska. Uh, we hope so. We hope so. That's that's the optimistic. That's the optimistic view. Yeah. yeah. Um, but keep advocating. Out there, yeah, um, we're taking a little time just to talk about the situation. We'll be very clear. We are not advocating in this moment um, because there's rules about sort of right. using tools yeah. like that. Yeah. So we're just talking about the situation, um, and it's uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Right, right. But we are here to play Sell the Singularity. This is yes. our fifth time playing it. Maybe we'll reach the singularity this time, I'm hoping. And, and I'm really excited to see these counters are in units that I don't even <laughs> know I believe that is quadrillion. <laughs> that is quadrillion. Um, and the first thing that we'd like to say before we start playing is this is a game. Yeah. So when it boots up, it says, hello, creator. The, the, there's one, there's, a, there's a, a designer. It's you and me. We're playing together. But in real evolution... As far as we understand it right now, yeah. there's no one guiding force behind that, it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We're we're really thinking of evolution as a mechanism, not as a pair of hands that are you know, manipulating. Interesting. So, the, the, as a mechanism, that's is it a tool of the universe, or is it like because when I hear mechanism, I think like the gear in a a watch or a, or a, a gyroscope. Yeah, and and you can think about that as. You know, the idea of natural selection is this mechanism that cre that generates this change in biological diversity. Is it a perpetual motion engine evolution, <laughs> this mechanism that's working? Does anything stop it or does it go on and on and on? Yeah, um, lack of variation stops it. So there are, you know, it, uh, people, evolutionary biologists, talk about variation, heritable variation, as the fuel for natural selection. Whoa! So heritable, so, yeah, heritable variation. Yeah, so variation that you can pass on to their your offspring, right? So if it's not heritable, then then we then evolution, natural selection can't work on that. So if you if you're as as a human being, you've encountered something in their life that m makes you uh, lose a limb, right? When you uh, have progeny, they're going to have. If, if everything works out in the genetic code as we expect it. Yeah, they don't start going, life without a, a limb. And, yeah. Inherit. So that's a heritable variation. That's right. not a heritable variation. Right. Yeah. But if you've got some weird new special blue eye color that no one's had before. Yes. And it happens to be encoded in not just your genes in your eye, but in your gametes, in your eggs and sperm that you're passing on to that next generation. So that's the other. You know, mutations that develop within your soma, within your body, um, those aren't necessarily able to be passed on. They have to be mutations in the germline. Very yes. And we can edit that now. That's right. Human beings. Yes. That's a whole scary... Let's see. <laughs> Let's, maybe we'll get to there in the singularity. All right, so we're going to be looking over there. We've got the thing. So I believe these are quadrillions. And that's what these units are. Um, and this is the stuff that we can go shopping. You can do some more research. These are all the sort of the micro level things that are going on. Here's the ideas. This is the things that we can buy when we want to get a hundred trillion dollar idea burst. We can <laughs> spend some Darwinium on that. And over here, take a look at our tech tree and see how far we've gotten. So it looks pretty good. We're up here in the information age. 
uh, just to review. So this is, um, we, we started out in the primordial soup. So here we are, and that's the sort of our solar system, the simulation of that. <laughs> then here's the lowest level with all of those things crawling around in there. Does it excite you to see uh, the ladder of life, uh, uh, like the DNA structure? Is there something that triggers in your brain? Like, oh my God, that's, that's my life's work right there. Yeah, you know, there is something appealing about the double helix as a, yeah. as a form. I've been using that in some presentations uh, as a stand-in for talking about complex genomic and genetic things. And, and I think it's one of those um, uh, icons that is starting to become recognizable for, for lots of people. It means a building block. Yeah. With only four little things going on in there. Yeah. How is that? That's amazing. Um, so that's the primordial soup level. And then as we grow up as organisms, we begin to swim around. And that's sort of what we know on Earth. Is that an accurate thing? That was sort of the next thing? Yeah. On yes. the cladogram, the cladograms, 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 cladograms. Yeah, ways of of organizing that diversity, uh, which gets away from. So when I was in school, we had the tree of life, and it's yeah. sort of simulated in the tech tree. But that's not really how. Yeah, no, that's it's, we still talk about evolutionary trees, phylogenetic trees. We talk about branches and twigs and leaves, like that. That whole um, nomenclature is still is still very present in the world. Is that a fun pun thing for you to draw upon for presentation titles? Um, <laughs> I don't do so much of that work uh, specifically, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there, there's um, scientists are have some real terrible sense of humor. I think they so, do. <laughs> they have they sort of a dark a dark sense of humor. They they understand the world in ways that. We're all trying, that they, are, they want to teach us how that works. Here's land. Here we've got some humans. I believe there are uh, two sexes of humans there now, all right. uh, which have some primitive clothing on them. They've got some mammals and some lizards and all that sort of stuff. It's pretty crowded there. Yeah, yeah. This is not they, the place to be. No, they need, they need a city. <laughs> and then the next step was this, which is the Iron Age, and people are making weapons and going to war and things like that. That's all very, very barbaric but violent. That is sort of... That's defined a lot of human growth as a culture. Has technology impacted us on a, on a you know, genetic or a genomic scale? Like, is having a watch make me a more advanced <laughs> species? Well, it's certainly, um, you know, our, uh, our lifestyle and our diet has certainly impacted, uh, you know, things like our uh, lifespan. And uh, there are... Uh, genetic predispositions to different diseases, heart disease, uh, um, uh, cholesterol-associated uh, diseases, and things like that. So we've certainly seen and can uh, detect uh, molecular signatures of human evolution. Yeah. And so we can we can improve that? Like if we work together, could we make ourselves even better than we are now? Well, I mean, you're... Without starting, gene editing. Yeah. <laughs> Gene editing would be one uh, that, <laughs> that's that, ethically that, that we're, discouraged. We're not thinking about, and then you know, selective breeding programs, and we usually don't think about those in the context of human populations. So Have, is there a, a correlation between the people that? Um, so, if you are attracted to someone of the same sex, you're not probably going to have children unless you have some sort of artificial way to procreate. Does that change evolution? That. Um, it, it, it it certainly can. I don't. I don't honestly know about any of the. Um, this is this kind of gets back to the heritable yeah, variation. Yeah. Um, any uh, genetic or heritable links to um, being predisposed to one sex or the other, and so um, I think that that's that's what makes that kind of idea a little bit more complex. That is, a, that is a huge societal and scientific uh, yeah. quandary, which is more than what we're streaming about uh, today. So after that, we get into learning time. Ooh, look at that. So what is that little thing? What if I mouse over it? What is it? If I click on it, what does it tell me? Oh, it wants to quick trigger the quantum charge to earn some evolution. It can get six trillion ideas, uh, five trillion ideas, and six trillion entropy. Shall we do it? Sure. All right. Seems... Let's let's go big or go home. Trigger for yeah. one Darwinium. Boom, look at all that stuff just jumped up there. So this is a, a lab, a primitive laboratory. There's a sextant there and an astrolabe, I believe. Is that what you call those things? Yeah. And a book and a candle. It's, 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 I mean, it's amazing. It's like 
the, my lab upstairs. That's uh, what I was, <laughs> that was my next question. Is, it, is that what that looks like? Up there? And from this level, we get to the atomic age uh, where we have people communicating. There's a computer, look at that computer. Yeah. And a, and a train. Yes, and I'm glad I don't have to use that computer anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> so also, um, the game is pretty fun. Very, very simple animations, but some complex ideas yeah. that are that are included in the yeah. game. And that's as far as we've gotten so far. Um, so the tech tree is our key to unlocking more things in the future. So we have some resources to spend. This is where we're at right now. Last time we just started talking about mapping the genome and the DNA storage. Unfortunately, last time we streamed in silence. Oh no. It's a lost <laughs> episode, like so many great episodes of Doctor Who or whatever you want out there. Maybe we can do some uh, uh, transcribing we with can. lip reading. That's true, <laughs> it, it still exists, so we can just, or we can do some bad lip reading, one of those <laughs> yeah, things. Our, um, we our, talked a little bit about uh, DNA storage, which is such a fascinating thing. The idea of taking information and packing it in that level yeah, of, st of storage, your DNA. How does that work? Yeah, so it's it, the, I, the principle behind it is to encode information instead of ones and zeros on a computer hard drive. You would encode it into A's, T's, G's, and C's in this biomolecule. Um, so is that twice as much? You get one and a zero with binary, but with this you have four. Yeah, so you have four options, but... Um, so this is uh, starting to get a little outside of my uh, That's what we like, house pushing here. that Devin. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you want to build some redundancy into that uh, translation so that it's a little bit more error proof. Um, and so you don't get kind of extra bits in that language. You get some extra bits. And so you can store it in fewer characters or fewer A's, T's, and G's, and C's. But um, it's not just kind of you know, four times as much or or eight times as much, depending on how the power the rules then work. That's there. math. <laughs> but is this something we're doing? Is DNA storage happening right now? It is. Um, not not for the kind of things where you know you want to uh, digitize your uh, grandma's photos and put them into a tube of DNA, and you're going to put that on your shelf forever, <laughs> right there. Um, but I I actually saw a talk on this just uh, at a conference a few uh, months ago, and uh, they were. Uh, using it to uh, track packages, basically as ways of of labeling, secretly labeling uh, packages, and seeing about storage of that, um, how stable those devices were or those uh, labels were. And, uh, Interesting. So, so you can imagine, you know, um, uh, ways of detecting. Just like people are uh, looking at signatures on uh, bombs or something like something dramatic like mm -hmm. that, you know, they look for some chemical signature. You're basically adding a chemical or a biological signature to uh, in, or tangible items. So That's uh, the world we live in is pretty incredible. Yeah, I thought. I mean, it was uh, the experiment was pretty clever. Clever. They, you know, literally uh, printed the DNA out on postage stamps uh, or you know stickers that they attached to letters and mailed across the country and. And retrieved it back, and then see, see, saw if they could uh, decode that uh, DNA. Interesting. So. Is that something you want to do? Are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't want to. <laughs> not going to do that. Shall we buy some DNA storage? Yeah, that seems like a. Um, hopefully, it's not a dead end there. No, it's tree. two trillion ideas there. Um, and then we got what? Well, okay, so we have video games. What about buying the internet? Um, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's vital for us. I right? believe you're actually right. correct. <laughs> um, and then a graphic user interface. Yeah, that's, we needed that. Yeah, I use the to... command line for a lot of my work. <laughs> but uh... oh, where's that going over there? All right, so we've got this thing connecting. Oh, a moon base. This seems to be the way to go to the singularity. Yeah. Shall we buy a moon base? Sure. Let's yeah. See what that does. That's and okay. It, it seems appropriate uh, given the. Uh, Anniversary, the Apollo yes. anniversary. Yeah. Absolutely, maybe just. Well, we missed the moon mission. That's right here. We did that last time. So, oh, here's Apollo 11 itself. Speaking of, I can get this. There we go. There's Apollo 11. So let's click on that just to pay tribute. And it made the information age 20% more efficient. <laughs> Thank you, astronauts and all the team. Um, let's buy some email. We can't do work without that. And the internet. Still waiting to. Unlock. Oh, maybe I didn't. Oh, CD-ROMs. I didn't click on the internet to fully buy it. There we go. Oh, the emergent age. 
Hey, that's something that we do here at UAF. <laughs> Unmanned aerial vehicles yes. studies. Yeah, we are uh, seem to be one of the centers of UAVs, right? It's yeah. true. It's true. And there's amazing work going on with that that could help out, like in, with the DNA storage um, or with de de delivering medical supplies mm -hmm. or pizza. <laughs> Sometimes medicine. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Very true. Yeah, one of my colleagues down at, at Anchorage, microbiologist, uses uh, uh, small aerial vehicles for um, survey work at some of, her, uh, some of his uh, field sites. Uh, so, so you've had, um, I, I just, I was all distracted by yeah, the, no, the, the quadcopter no. up there. You've used some of this uh, cutting edge technology. We've talked about the, the, the um, mobile device can attack to, to the genome yeah, mapper. Yeah, the minion sequencer, yeah. The, and so you've got that. And are there other technologies that you're looking at, including some of the field work that you're doing later on? Yeah, so um, people, uh, many researchers have thought about, you know, where can we put that minion? What can we connect it with? Um, so several people in our uh, marine and ocean sciences program here have thought about uh, put it in, putting the sequencer or trying to figure out how to link it with uh, underwater glider. So, you know, the equivalent of drones, but right. that they're used in, in ocean uh, surveys. Um, so, so you throw the thing, well, not throw, but you gently place the technology in the ocean. Yeah, so real-time genetic-based surveys um, done in situ, right in the water. That was that sounds amazing. What would you get from that? What, how is that different from like collecting a bunch of samples then bringing them back in and sequencing them that way? Yeah, so time sensitivity, right? If there, maybe there's something terribly interesting in the ocean right where you are. And you know, it's not trivial to get to the middle of the ocean, right? We have the Sekuliak, which is great. It brings us to wonderful places, but it's months and months of planning. It would be a shame if you collected samples for a month, brought them back to the lab, and two years later or two months later, you figured out, hey, when we were at this spot, there was something terribly interesting, and I wish we had stayed there for another day. But with this technology, you'd be able to see it right there aboard the yeah. ship in the lab. On the ship. They have a great wet lab. They do, yeah. And Benthic Lab and the CTD and all that cool stuff. Yeah. Go look at Sequiliac. There's all sorts of cool stuff. Um, okay, so looks like we did make some... I'll ask you that when I go back over here. Um, when you were a student and decided that you wanted to stay in academia for your, your professional career, was it because of the technology that you got to use, or was it the ideas that came before that technology, and you're finding new ways to use this technology to, to stimulate your imagination? Yeah, as an undergraduate, I was, I was really um, privileged to be at a very small institution where I was able to do research. That, it, it was hands-on research. I got to do DNA sequencing back many moons ago now, <laughs> <laughs> using very different technology, and, and so, um, those tools really engaged me with that. Uh, the questions that we were asking, those were, um, uh, at the time, basic biology questions. What's the organization? What's the evolutionary history of this group of organisms? That was exciting to be able to try and find the answers with these tools. So, um, you know, it was a combination of, of both things. I think the thing that you said that was just so exciting is this trying to find. Like, science is, there's no end. Like every, yeah. almost, I would say, 90% of the scientific <laughs> papers I read said, more research is needed yeah. in order to really pin down this idea. Is it, is that, does that keep you motivated, this never-ending, always trying something new? There's this, this, this discovery, this finding, just leads me to the next thing. Yeah, it, it, it definitely uh, it, it encourages me to keep pursuing. You know, I know that once I find out you know, this information, it will allow me to ask more and more questions. And so that's, that's terribly exciting. The, the drawback is when do you, you know, put a pin in things? Yeah. You know, when do you stop and, and uh, publish a paper or, or submit a manuscript or uh, talk about your research at a conference? That's the, that's the challenge with, with, I would say, that's not unique to any discipline. Because your peers are like, yes, but what about this? Yeah. Or what about that? Or did you think about this? And you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't think about that. You're right, scientist from Hull University. <laughs> I should have thought about something. 
And I think that's a challenge for, you know, when students are transitioning from mm. being a student in the class to conducting independent research, you know, uh, even laboratory-based classes, there's a beginning, middle, and end to a, a, a laboratory or research that's conducted. You get a grade. You get a grade. You turn in an assignment and you're done, right? That's the end. Even if there are 10 other questions, <laughs> you, you, you know what you have to do. And in, in research, independent research, there, there is no assignment to turn in. You, you don't know when to stop necessarily. Um, and that's a, that's a difficult transition for, for that, all of us. Is that difficult for you as a, a research scientist and a classroom professor to like, okay, I need to limit them of what they're going to be doing? And you, do you look for people who want to know more? Like you encourage them? Certainly, yeah. Yeah, the, um, identifying uh, students who who are curious and, and, and maybe you can provide them opportunities that, that will inspire them to be even more curious. That's definitely something that you look out for. And you've found that here on the Fairbanks campus. I have, I um, have every, every semester, you know, there are students that are um, more engaged with the material than an average. And you can tell that, you know, if you give them that opportunity, if you lower the barrier for them to discover more things, they're going to, just jump right in. So. I think it was a, a I watch, you watch that Stranger Things program. I, I haven't actually. I'm but. currently watching <laughs> season three. This isn't a spoiler or anything, but there is a, a science teacher who's a character on the show, and he says, what I tell my students is, once you unlock that door of curiosity, anything is possible. Of course, on that show, it's monsters and yeah. invasions. But I thought that's a very, you know, sciencey thing to say. Like, you got to unlock that, your curiosity mm -hmm. for it, and you get to do that for Young minds. Yeah. It's, or it's, old minds. Anybody can come anybody, to your Yes, that's right. <laughs> All right, let's keep on going. Okay, so we've, uh, we've got to the emergent age. What does this little arrow mean now? Oh, I bought another one, maybe? I don't, oh, I did buy another one. Whoops. Um, we've still got six quadrillion ideas. So which would you, oh, I guess, I know you're probably a fan <laughs> of biotech. Yeah, that seems like something that's pretty important. What is it linking back to? What is let's see what happens. So we go, biotech links down to... I should have bought that other mouse to, uh, to uh, map the genome, oh, right. which we're doing. We haven't unlocked that little thing yet. Um, okay, so we got the biotech. What is that? The mind upload. Oh, oh we are getting close. This. I'm going to wait for that one because that's pretty <laughs> exciting. Um, what's this one over here? Cryptocurrency. Have you invested in that, Devin? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nor have I. Well, a lot of talk about that lady. Uh, lately. Uh, 3D printing. Do you do that? I, I have used it actually uh, in my lab, making uh, a few uh, custom devices. Not I haven't designed them, but other people have come up with the uh, blueprints for these things. It's a wonderful technology. It's, yeah, and it's I think one of the, the highlights of it, at least currently, is the sharing. Like, hey, I designed this cool thing. I just want people to use it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe later on there'll be patents and money and all that sort of stuff. I'm sure that is out there too. But. <laughs> But you can just download some ideas and print them off in your lab. Uh, a smartphone, we've got those. Yeah. And machine learning, that's a scary thing. It, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful thing. Okay, Mr. Scientist. <laughs> it is a powerful thing. Well, what does that mean? You've spent your life studying how organics work. Yeah. Is that science uh, passe now? Is it too old? We should be, be thinking about how machines work with organics. Or have you already started... How to make a Terminator? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, ma machine learning is a—it's an a, a rebranding of old concepts. Uh, so it's uh, you know, it, it, machine learning and AI. These are speaking of right here. Yeah, that's right. It's it, it's even a separate concept there. Uh, so machine learning—the idea is a machine can do a task, and then oh, the singularity is close, so close. A machine does a task; it learns from what it does wrong, what it's been programmed to do, yes. and then corrects itself next time? Yeah. I know we both might be treading around. And... <laughs> My understanding is it, it's, it mostly relies on uh, you can train a machine based on you give it some inputs that have known outputs. And so you say, okay, I'm going to give you this or a whole set of these things, like a whole set of faces, pictures of faces, and you say, you know, all these are um, men and all of these are women. And it, it 
then comes up with a set of rules that you don't know. That's the black box of the machine mm. learning. So you don't say, you know, this is what a woman looks like, this is what a man looks like. Uh, you just give it a set of training data. Those rules are uh, uh, built by the machine based on the input. So you can be, this is a bird, this is a fish. Correct, yeah. And then you show it some remote sensing thing and it says, there's 25 birds and 35 fish out there. That's right. And you're like, actually, I'm looking at it. That's not a bird. That's a fish. So we got it. <laughs> or that's an elephant. That's it. <laughs> I learned something new. So machine learning, um, is that what we do with our children? Uh, give them some inputs and outputs. Yeah, yeah. you give them an alphabet and you know what comes out of that. It's words in our language. Yeah. You give them numbers and the outcomes is the mathematics. Is that, <laughs> well, are we just machines? <laughs> I, I would imagine that a lot of neuroscientists would would take issue with that, so I'll stay away from their, Fair enough. their territory. I'll just you could just think about that. That's a good presentation uh, for the future. Okay, self driving cars. Uh, would you buy a self driving car, yes. Devin? You would. I mean, Fairbanks is, a, I think, a challenge for self driving. It is. Cars. I've I've talked to some um, uh, engineers. Uh, who study that sort of stuff. Alaska is like the worst place, especially rural Alaska. That is not self-driving cars. Yeah. They're a while away. Um, all right, let's get this. Let's buy some drones. Looks like we're still got quadrillions of ideas as we accumulate them. Nanotech? 60 billion ideas. Yes, some nanotech. That sounds good. All right, let's buy some nanotechnology. Self-assembly. This it seems like we're... This is all... Oh, there was a little glitch. Uh-oh. Machines can build and organize at the atomic level. Humankind can reshape matter, creating the very building blocks of life in our laboratories. The singularity is upon us. Is humanity prepared for this brave new world? Are we? <laughs> Are we, Devin, prepared? Uh, okay, so let's upload a mind. Now that's, would you do that? I don't know. Would you upload your mind? It's... Uh... No, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that question. <laughs> I mean, it's a, in science fiction, there it is right there. Wow. And there's stuff beyond the singularity. Yeah, I'm curious <laughs> to see what's going to happen. I'm a little nervous. Like, we get to, it's Christmas morning. Do I want to unwrap my present? Um, but let's talk about this mind upload. So let's take that the technology exists in this simulation. Yeah. That you can take, let's say your mind can 100% be moved from this body, and you yourself as a biologist know how weak and frail our bodies are. Right, yeah. At the same time, strong. But, uh, I mean, I've always got the impression from science fiction movies that once I do that, that's not me anymore, right? That, that's, uh, or is it the ultimate you? Yeah, right. <laughs> Freed from sleep, food, money. I guess you need some sort of currency, a cryptocurrency. Yeah, right. We just use <laughs> cryptocurrency. I don't know. It's a big question. And DNA storage. Is yeah. that, do biologists talk about that? I mean, is that something that you read about in the, the more bleeding edge journals or the weird blogs that you might read at 1130 <laughs> at night and after you finish creating papers? You're like, uh, that's not the kind of stuff I read. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been, you know, I, I used to read a lot of science fiction and certainly was in, you know, a lot of science fiction that I, I read and. Uh, but uh, yeah, it is. It is. Um, and you know, if the machines can build themselves, why would they even need an organic brain? Or maybe they would kidnap us just to have sort of. I know that's a whole other. <laughs> that's not this game. Oh, we can buy a rover. We connect, connect some of the connect some of these things before we commit to a humanoid robot. No. Oh. Whoa. Age achieved. Rover. We are going to Mars, wow. Devin. I had no idea that we were going to be going to other planets. Look, we got a whole new symbol, a rocket. All right. Now we. <laughs> Let's not, maybe we should take this side path before we commit to the singularity. Uh, let's visit a mountain. I hear Olympus Mons is beautiful this time of year. Um, I don't want a nine trillion. Should we buy the singularity while we still have it? Yeah, we certainly don't want to get carried away. I know, we're on <laughs> Mars. This was the whole point of the exercise. Um, okay, should we just do it? Yeah. It okay, like it's... let's see what happens. See if your computer glitches again. Yeah. Unlock the simulator. Your game progress will reset. All earnings will be converted into metabits. So we'd go back to the very beginning, the primordial soup, and everything would be. Let's not do that quite yet. 
Yeah, let's not let's not end before we explore Mars. <laughs> um, okay, so that costs nine trillion. So let's just keep an eye on our resources up there. <laughs> uh, all right, shall we build a humanoid robot? Yeah, that seems. Uh... Here we go. Okay, so we built a humanoid robot. Um, let's, how about some uh, little Mars action over here? You want to do some space flight? Oh, yeah. that's two quadrillion. We're still safe, right? Yeah. We're still, we can still buy the singularity. Uh, interplanetary space flight. Let's find some ice. We need some ice up there. It's that 600 trillion. All right. That's still not. What did we not unlock <laughs> there for our Martian exploration? There's, so I found that if we go over to here, there might be some secret things, or we can get a hundred trillion. So we, we've got the Darwinium, if need be, that we can buy this stuff for this. Come on, Pointer, where are you? Come back over here. I'm going to be there. Okay, so up here, um, we can unlock some of this research, which I have found opens up some of these things. So there's some genome mapping. We haven't spent any of these things yet. Let's do that. Look, see, it opens up some more things. Ah, right. uh, what about human cloning? Where do you fall on that? Um, uh, that does not seem like a good idea. Okay, from we'll, an ethical standpoint, we'll we'll still we're gonna buy it here in the game. We're gonna unlock some human cloning, bioengineering, also sort of a ethically gray area. Yeah, it, but humans have been bioengineering. That's right. Forever, right? It's it's this is another rebranding thing. You know, do we do we call the cultivation of corn is that bioengineering or I don't know? Is it? A, a, you know, it, it's unclear to me where the line is. You know, when we when we have all of our fancy breeds of dogs, you know, when did we? When are those just us being really good uh, uh, dog breeders? And when are when when is that bioengineering? When have we gone too far? <laughs> so is is our corn too delicious now? We've gone too far <laughs> with corn or any really fruits and vegetables and. Produce like this farming seems to be an okay place, except now people are the GMOs are very concerned about That's right. that. Yeah, but I mean, monks were doing genetically modified growing of grapes to make delicious wine and beer. That's right. There's a, I mean, there's a not that grapes make beer, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna take away all your they points are, on all that. my hoodoo <laughs> points are gonna go away. Um, yeah, it's, a, I, I think people have made to me, people have made good arguments that these kinds of improvements to our agriculture or food production are, are necessary to support our population. So I think that's a, and we've talked about that uh, in the past, is um, one of the things that it's, it's uh, availability of resources and the ways to make sure that you keep your area clean, yeah. that, that your waste is not counteracting your growth. Right, yes. And so maybe, you know, we can eat better, all things like that. Okay, um, what about some, so we're gonna buy bioengineering, sure. we're gonna unlock that. What is ectasis? That sounds like something that you would say in class. <laughs> it, it certainly does. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not let's, something I say. Let's in buy class. it and find out what it says. Uh, the tetrapods are more efficient. All right. So, whatever ectasis. What about a neocortex? Yeah, that's, we're just going to spend some of this money and see what happens. Oh, I see. Lines. We're filling in our tech tree. Yeah, a little down below there. A ball and socket wrist joint. Yeah. That sounds like a pretty more more you know better not everybody ball. Not, better <laughs> racket. Not all <laughs> animals have these things, and look how amazingly simple it is for me to do it. Until you break your wrist, and then you find out how yeah. important. Yeah. Are the little are the joints and the the parts of our body that make our limbs able to do all these things? Is that important for our being the apex species on this planet? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's. Um, well, it's, it's one of those things that connects us with a lot of organisms. You know, we can look at arms and legs and all kinds of joints across the tree of life and see those similarities, see those patterns. You know, we can see arms and legs in dolphins and humans that it may not be so obvious, you know, when we're looking at from the outside. But when you look at the skeletal stru structure, you see those fingers that are right there in, in what we are calling flippers. And, but it's just been changed in a way that makes it their environment, which yeah. is usually the water. Right. So they can go both places. <laughs> it's crazy, crazy dolphin. Um, let's get that ball and socket joint while we're talking about it. And what else is down here that we can unlock simply with some entropy? Looks like we've unlocked all the entropy things. Um, great. 
I just want to see what our tech tree looks like now. I saw email on there. Oh, was, we not? Was, oh, you want to get some email? No, I, was no, I don't want any email. <laughs> We're going to get it. 184 billion. <laughs> Let's see what happens. We're going to unlock. Can email. we achieve the singularity without we, email? We we can, <laughs> as we found out. We are there right now. Uh, video games. Let's get that because we are playing a video game. It's a little meta. It's surprising. It the very cost is. <laughs> can you buy sell the singularity in the game? That's my question. Um, all right. Has that opened up any of these other things? Nope. Interesting. Like, what have we not gotten that lets us get up to here? I oh, three billion ideas. Um, let's see what else would you like to buy? Maybe we should start spending some ideas. Nuclear power. Some music. Ah, nuclear power. I wonder if that's helping us. Oh, let's do, find out. Uh, oh, there's just a little one down here. Huh. Help us get to the atomic bomb. <laughs> relativity. I'm going to buy relativity. We need to understand. Closet uh, physics. Yes. Uh, geek, uh, <laughs> just slip that one right in there. <laughs> um, all right. I'm just curious. What are we not? What do we need to unlock to keep our exploration of Mars going here? More rovers? <laughs> uh, phonograph. We've got. A, we can spend a hundred million on that. Mm. Yeah. Tribalism. <laughs> mm. What's that like? So scientists love to collaborate. Science is not possible without collaboration. Right. But you don't go to a physics conference. Yeah. So there is sort of a tribalism when it comes to science. <laughs> but um, there is some, you know, uh, uh, moving into other fields. Uh, uh, there's a, a giant conference called AGU that happens where I, I think about half of the researchers here at Fairbanks go to that conference. Yeah. And they're all not all biologists. Um, and so there are conferences that just naturally bring a whole bunch of very disparate fields together. Um, but there are times when um, scientists will, uh, biologists will go to a physics conference. I went to a, an education conference. Now that's still kind of in my wheelhouse, but the, um, that conference, they were speaking a whole new language. You know, it's still English, but um, it was a whole new kind of education language that, that I wasn't familiar with. I was definitely out of my depth. I talked to a scientist who's going to be a big part of a big international expedition, the Mosaic Expedition, that could be frozen mm -hmm. out on, the, on an icebreaker for a year. One of the things he talked about how great it was, was gonna, he was going to be able to be a part of science teams, not as a science lead, but just someone who is working on the team and learning about all how all those things work together. Is the scientific mind, the curiosity, does that get fired up when you're like, oh, this is something new, I don't know these things. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Um, uh, I, I've been collaborating on a project that is uh, it, it's in virology, and you know, virology is still biology, but there's a whole lot about viruses that are very foreign to other small organisms or other large organisms. There's a whole new language, and um, I just had a long conversation with a collaborator just before our meeting, and uh, yeah, it's. it's it's just awesome. He kind of rambles on, and it's just uh, wonderful to just soak it all in. Uh, just so. to be around and to get the ideas and the, the, the sparking of inspiration yeah. from yeah. that. Is our viruses our enemy? <laughs> <laughs> Not nearly. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, people are thinking about uh, viruses or rethinking about viruses, phages uh, in particular, as the next solution to our growing antibiotic crisis, right? We're running out of antibiotics more and more. Microbes that cause disease are becoming resistant to typical antibiotics. And, and so an idea that's been around for a very long time before antibiotics were used is uh, phage therapy. So basically using biology to fight biology, uh, to use this uh, warfare um, that to sounds, our advantage. That sounds, again, that's a science fiction thing. Like, <laughs> I don't know if that would, that sounds scary. Yeah, like it's like I think back in the 18th, 17th, 19th centuries, they're like, we have too many of this kind of animal. Let's bring in a predator that predates on that animal, yeah. and then we'll be fine. But things don't always work out. Yeah, yeah right. the Simpsons said it best. I think yeah, <laughs> a particular episode where they're just overrun with yes. snakes and monkeys or something at the end of that. Episode. So is that a risk for this phage therapy? Yeah. Is that you go again? How, when do scientists know when to stop? Yeah. So um, the limited. Uh, field cases that I've seen so far, it, it's not one of these kind of escalating things, you know, what do you kill the phages with after, after they've killed the bacteria and 
Um, they're, they're selecting uh, researchers, medical doctors, they're selecting pages that are very specific. They have a target. Once they run out of that target, they're gone. So, Is there a talk in your field about if we should treat diseases? Um, like, if, if you get sick, isn't that just the natural world telling you, like, <laughs> we're working together here? No, that's, that's not the... That's not a discussion <laughs> that my field is having. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. That's, um, okay, so let's, uh, well, we talked about selective breeding, so let's get some of that. we still got two quadrillion. How about some medicine? We were just talking about some sure, medicine. Yeah, seems... um, unlock a little bit of the Bronze Age stuff. we get some university. That's pretty cheap. Still keeping an eye on what we got going on there. Oh, we can unlock a newspaper for 11 million. Let's do that. Oh, a turbine. I don't want to unlock the machine gun. I'm not going to laugh. <laughs> um, let's see what goes on over here. That rover, it wants us to buy more, and we still can buy. We can buy one singularity or many singularities. Wow. I'm curious why that thing has not. What is what it's hiding up here for our Martian exploration? Uh, some colonialism? <laughs> That was never a really a good thing. Um, has that changed? I mean, is there, was there... So colonists come into a place where they haven't been before, and there's a population of humans that are already living there, and they may crossbreed, and that's sort of the heritage trait yeah, to so, come from another continent over. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that all about? Talk to me about how that has changed us as a species. Well, so one... Um, one no, it, not the, Anecdote, but one thing that I do like to think about is that you know humans have right have spread over thousands of years uh, across this planet, and as a result, right, we some of that variation has been partitioned across the planet, and um, through more recent traveling, you know, we've kind of started to mix that variation, and and um, I think that's a great thing, uh, uh, but. Well, we were kind of spreading across the globe, we were also taking with us microbes. We were taking with us diseases. And so these were good and bad things, but, but those also diverged. And um, so there's some ideas about how the, all of the microorganisms, all the things that we carried with us as we explored the planet, they were co-evolving with us. So they were changing and adapting just as Humans were changing. Like so you used, before you go on, you used evolve, which I know is, a, for you, using that word is is more than just a, a lay person who uses yes. evolve. Yeah, yeah, so actual genetic changes, yes, right. Um, and uh, so, you know, that these uh, microorganisms uh, were, are, are different. And uh, so one of them that I, I know about is um, H. pylori, right? So this is a, uh, one of the causative agents of stomach ulcers, and mm -hmm. if it's really bad, it can cause stomach cancers and things like that. And uh, so if you look at uh, different lineages, of historical lineages of humans, you can see a, a branching pattern, and you can see that same branching pattern of historical lineages of H. pylori. Um, and so there are uh, European strains, there are African strains, there are... Um, uh, uh, Western Hemisphere strains that basically have followed us along. And so there are some interesting research now looking at what happens when humans are infected with quote unquote wrong H. pylori. So what if they get infected with a strain that they haven't spent 100,000 years co-developing with? Um, and some of the evidence suggests that bad things happen, increased rates of cancer. And um, so that's kind of an interesting idea. How do you catch that? <laughs> how do you, or I guess better question, how do you avoid <laughs> getting the wrong kind? Yeah, so in most cases, you know, it's, it's um, I think it's not something you can avoid. Uh, for H. pylori, it's highly transmissible. Most of us have H. pylori or have had it at some point in our life, and um, so it's, it's very difficult. But um, cases like here in Alaska or a particular research case in um in South America, where you have um, indigenous populations interacting a lot with Western populations. And this is generating that kind of mismatch. Um, 
between microorganisms and human interactions. Is there a way to make them get along, or is it just something that we don't know? <laughs> well, you know, so some people have thought about, you know, well, infecting them with the, the right one and um, looking for uh, the right combination. But, uh, so if you were born on a plane with a, people who have the same H. pylori <laughs> as you, and you land in a country that has a different one, you, there's a chance that you're going to, yeah, you could, as a little baby, yeah, and you would never, not like a face mask, you're going <laughs> to, yeah, you're yeah, gonna keep that. <laughs> interesting, yeah, interesting. So. How, when you, you're a father, you're a parent, yes, and you have how many children? Two. You have two children. Uh, so as you watch them grow, when do you start teaching them about this sort of stuff? Like, or do you wait for them to come to you with questions? Mm -hmm. Do they see the work that you do? Or yeah, they see the do you give them blocks. You're like, this could be a gene. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I I don't hide the science I do. My kids are are well aware of it. Uh, as a a working parent, there are some times when my kids are in my office and. Uh, Dad has to do really boring stuff <laughs> <laughs> for them. For, for them, you, not boring. Not boring. Uh, so um, yeah, so I, I've been uh, talking about science and evolution uh, since they were very young. Uh, so and, uh, I, I enjoy it. I, think, uh, I, I don't have any expectations that my children are both going to be biologists, uh, but I want to inspire their curiosity wherever. Are they of an age where they're interacting with other children and they come home and ask you things that the kids have asked them if they brought them up in conversation? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. someone says we should not clone humans, but <laughs> Sally thought we should. <laughs> yeah, those kind of questions. <laughs> we don't have that, that, those advanced not discussions yet, but, yet, but uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm not too far out from those kind of questions. Are they, do they ever stump you or are they like, wow, kids are talking about things I would never imagine? Um, not not. Not yet, but my older daughter is just in kindergarten, so I think I've got kindergarten level. Stuff. <laughs> You've got that stuff, but that's just, it's coming. It's yeah. coming in the future. Yeah. It's coming yeah. in the future. Um, okay, so, oh man, I just want to know. You're, you're curious about I'm this. I'm very <laughs> curious about the colonization of it would Mars. Be, it would be cruel if the game just had like a couple of empty. Just, uh, it doesn't go, and this one obviously is connected to somewhere. Oh, let's buy a game engine that's obviously that. Virtual reality, Okay. That's just across the hall. Have you used that for your work yet? So I you have some VR. I haven't. I, I've talked to, to folks in the EPSCoR office about um, uh, creating some uh, uh, worlds of my field sites that I work at. And oh. So I've thought about that. But um, there's some people doing way more creative stuff with that technology. You were talking about the, the in situ study in the ocean. In place, sort of right. a Latin word for yeah. in the place yes. where it is. Um, but could you do a VR ocean tank where you just, like, you don't need all the gear. You could just be underwater. Yeah, that would be... Uh, and then you connect with a glider that's off Sekuliak, but you're right upstairs. And then you can do... I'm just, the next game, I think. I'm just, uh, I'm just dreaming right now. Um, <laughs> all right, let's uh, spend this Darwinium. Yeah. Because we're running out of time. Um, so I think if we go down... Let's see. Uh, I don't want to buy more Darwinium, because then maybe we can, let's see, where do I shop? Is it in here? Yeah, it's in the lightning bolt? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's buy 100 trillion ideas. That's a quadrillion. Now. <laughs> so now we're up to three quadrillion. Um, what can we get over here that might unlock that <laughs> damned, <laughs> damned Martian thing? More rovers? Surely not. No, I don't want to spend all the money on that. But maybe it is just more rovers. That's what sort of unlocked other things is really amping up the things that you've got. Uh, okay. uh, I could buy more atomic age stuff. I think we're just gonna have to go for the singularity. Seems like I think that's what we got to do because our time is almost up. <sighs> well, I was hoping that we'd get there, and we did, since it is sell to singularity. Yeah. Um, uh, before I do this, <laughs> it's been great. Um, thank you so much for coming and hanging out, sharing the knowledge of all the stuff that you do, your experiences as a, a professor, as a student, as a father. I mean, it's really great to talk about all these things. And I think it's safe to say, um, I have found this at least, and I, I'm assuming that you have as well, that you are a good representation 
of, the, of a faculty member here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I, I hope I hope I am. <laughs> <laughs> You're curious. You want to know more. You never stop striving to develop your skill sets. You're going to conferences that are helping you be a better educator, a better scientist, network with your peers. You're talking with people that are a little bit outside of your field on collaboration, things like that. I think all of that stuff happens here. It's happening right now all around us mm -hmm. at the university. Yes, certainly. Uh, these, are, these are things that I see in all of my colleagues here, uh, every one of them, from, from within the biology department to across in the English department and uh, physics everywhere. It's what has brought researchers here to, to Fairbanks, this beautiful community, very remote. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you can accomplish pretty much anything you want to do here if you have the will to do it. Yeah. yeah. Including welcoming the singularity. <laughs> I, I, let's see what happens when I do this. Are you ready? Here, why don't you, you do it? <gasps> okay, now you got to click on the yes. So we see what's going to happen. It's going to reset everything. Whoa, it's glitching. The universe <laughs> is rebooting. What is going to happen? Is it starting like a new... I need my 3D glasses Whoa, here. everything <laughs> is going crazy in this world we built. So there's the ocean. There's all the people. This, I think this is supposed to be simulating everything vibrating. Here it mm. is. This is the singularity happening to us right now in the game. Whoa! <laughs> Ah, the this simulation. Is, this is what the devs wanted. This is what they wanted us to do. The simulation has crashed. We went too far. We went too far. The question has been answered. How far can you go? Should we abandon or should we unite organics and machines? Uh, sure. Okay, great. Great. That, I think that's... We bought a reality engine with one thing. Oh, and now we have all this other sort of stuff. Looks like your bubble universe crashed. Err, uh, okay. To make a few modifications, your next universe should be able to handle the extra complexity. A technological singularity. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna, I'm not even gonna. Season two. Yes, season two. I'll believe it right there before we go and I'll save it right here on this computer. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Thank this you for the great. gift. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, thank you for making, I had a dream for a long time to stream on Twitch with a, 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 a faculty member and a teacher um, and talk about uh, how the game works. So you really made my dream come true. I appreciate that. Well, this much. was uh, really enjoyable for me as well. It so. was a blast. Um, okay, go look at our past streams and um, uh, maybe we'll see you again in the future. Who knows? Yes. Yeah.